describe him as one of the world's foremost academics may be factual, but it hardly does justice to his personality. He's also a man of strong convictions and a gentleman of the old school, full of charm and wit. So what is he actually like? Well, here's your chance to find out as I introduce you to Amartya Sen. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking me. Let's go back to October the 14th, 1998. You're in New York. Yeah. It's five in the morning and the phone rings. Could you ever have expected that you were just about to win the Nobel Prize? Well, I think it's a very difficult question to answer. I was quite sleepy. Of course, I flew the night before. I'd come up for the memorial meeting of my late friend, Mabu Bulhak. So I was in a kind of very sad mood, generally. And I knew I was going to make a speech on that later that day. Um, well, there had been some talk about my getting Nobel, possibly. I even had appeared in the front page of the Wall Street Journal two years before I actually got it as a likely candidate to get it. But so it wasn't, in a sense, once the, I mean, I didn't know that they were announcing the Nobel on that day. But, uh, you know, it was, um, it happens to people. I mean, you know, people do get stuck by one thing or another <laughs> sometimes. Um, I did, of course, not think of that at all when the phone rang, because my first thought was that something dreadful has happened to the children. Otherwise, why am I being woken up at an ungodly hour up for 5 o'clock in the morning, which is, of course, 11 in Stockholm. Had, One had of the enough. first things you did was ring your mother. She didn't believe you, did she? She, she was a bit reluctant to accept the news. Well, I, I first called my wife, who did believe it. Uh, my, my mother... I think it's true that she did say that she would fully believe it once she sees it on the television. But uh, uh, yes, I think there had been a certain amount of discussion of, of possibly my getting it. The Calcutta papers had been full of the possibility fact, of my getting it for many years. speculation had carried on for many years, and yes, some that, had that, come that. around to saying maybe he won't get no, it. No, that's right. I think in my mother's case, it was since the, this had been going on for some years, <laughs> it seemed to uh, her as a kind of annual ritual where the, <laughs> where the, where the, um, uh, the papers might mention that and, and nothing of the kind might happen. So I think that was what it was. So her remark that it, she would have to wait until the television <laughs> or the papers put it forward wasn't uh, entirely a silly reaction, I think. Earlier that year, 1998, you'd also just become Master of Trinity College, Cambridge. It's your old alma mater and probably one of the most coveted posts in British academic life. In a strange way, did that mean more? Yes, I think it did, yeah. Um, you know, for one thing, it was much more unexpected. And indeed, when uh, the, I was asked, uh, it, the, the Trinity College, I don't know how much you recognize, but the Trinity College mastership is, a, is appointed by the, is done by the Queen which really means the Prime Minister. You get a letter from the Queen, in fact. But the call comes from Downing Street, and it's um, the appointment secretary spends some time in college and trying to get the views of people. So fellows have, a view, have views which are reflected. But the ultimate decision is formally the Queen, but informally the, the Prime Minister. And I was actually in the, in the Bank of Italy when um, there was a phone call, and I was told that um, uh, there was a phone call from Downing Street for me, and it appeared to me that it was extremely unlikely. <laughs> but uh, but it, uh, I was told then that, that um, the Prime Minister wanted to send me a letter, and I was told, is it about the mastership of the college, of Trinity College? So I, my thought was, my wife was in, in England, and I called her. I said, look, you know, they must have a short list, and they want me to express views about that, and I was very flattered that they wanted me to, to express my priorities on them, but it turned out, of course, by the time I got to Harvard, when, where I was, that, in fact, they were offering me this position. My initial, I mean, I was very surprised, very honored and flattered, but also I felt that it wasn't really the right thing to do. I've been, you know, happy in Harvard, and I did a terrifically fine job. So you didn't jump at it? No, not at all. Actually, I took two months to decide on that. That was a very hard time, because you know, you don't discuss this at all, of course, because if I were not to take it, then no one would have known that this had been offered. And as it happened, I was vi visiting um, England a couple of times during that period and uh, had um, lunch also in college. And there was a great deal of speculation going on, and I was also told there were two names, there were pictures of two people who had been published in The Guardian. And I was asked which of these two are more likely 
And, and so you knew the actual answer all the while yourself? Well, I was very difficult, so I, you know, I had to, uh, I joined in in that. But, no, it was surprising. And by the, by the time two months was over, it was, it was clear to both my wife and me that I would be very silly not to take it, because it's a job very unusual. They, nothing like it is, is likely to happen, given the fact that I, you know, I In one, fact, 98 was a year when several things came away, because just after the Nobel Prize, you got the Bharat Ratna. Being honored in that way by your own country, did that mean something special to you? Yes, indeed. Um, no, Bharat Ratna, of course, is, a, is such an exceptional thing. Um, of course, it's, it's an odd thing here, of course, because it can be also awarded posthumously, so that it's not quite clear what is the field in which, uh, in which, um, with which they're uh, um, sort of making a comparative statement, as it were. I was very honored that um, Ravi Shankar was a co-recipient of Bharat Ratna with me. Um, and where were you when you got this phone call? It was New York for the Nobel, Bank of Italy for Master of Trinity <laughs> College. <laughs> yeah. No, this was in fact in Trinity College <laughs> that I was um, rung up about that. Of course, in Trinity, the Bharat Ratna is not understood at all. And in fact, um, I think the college secretary put up a lotus notice saying that, that I had got that. And I remember meeting one of my colleagues who asked, who told me, who, who had read that I'd got the Bharat Ratna, and he said, congratulations, Master, for whatever it is you have got. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then it was interesting that, uh, and, he, he, and then he said, well, explain to me what it is. So I said, well, it's meant to be a reasonably high honor given by the government of India. And then I mentioned that my co-recipient was Ravi Shankar. And then he said, oh, gosh, well, in that case, it would be very, must be a very distinguished <laughs> honor. So I said, yes, indeed. So Let's I, go I, back to the beginning of what I call the Amartya Sen story. You were named by Rabindranath Tagore. Your father yes. and your grandfather were both academics. What sort of childhood did you have? Well, very academic-oriented childhood. You know, I was born in the campus in Santa Nikesan. My father was te my grandfather was teaching there. My uh, father was teaching in Dhaka University. My paternal side is from Dhaka, uh, and uh, my father was a professor at Dhaka University. My grandfather had been also connected with the university. Indeed, he was the first treasurer of Dhaka University. So I grew up not far from Romna in Wari, which is close to the Dhaka University area. So I alternated between Santiniketan and Dhaka, but they were both very academic atmosphere. No, it was, uh, I mean, I'm, I like the life of an academic, and I don't think I'm, I don't really think um, I was um, being very um, silly about it, actually, because I like the things that I still do like. I like the time to think, uh, time to interact with students. It seemed marvelous. That there was something else you liked a lot in Shantinaketan where you were at school. You were very fond of your bicycle, and it's been with you almost ever since, hasn't it? It had. Unfortunately, it's no longer with me, actually, because in this context of the centenary of the Nobel Prizes, that bike, along with two books that I used to study, um, I was fond of, disappeared into the Nobel Museum, which is kind of, at the moment, it's in Stockholm, and then it's supposed to go to America and Japan and so on, go around. So the bike, actually, as you enter it, it's a kind of exhibit high up in the wall. It's quite thrilling to see my bike stuck there. Yes, I was very much on that. From my, from, I think I must have got it when I was um, nine or ten or something. So it's, 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 it's a, I could barely manage the full height on that. And it's uh, among the classes of bikes. I don't know how much you know these things. You know, there could be 26, 24, and 22 inches. This is the 22-inch bike because that's all I could manage. So at the moment, it's a bit, <laughs> a bit low. But uh, no, I was very much on it. But uh, the bike, I think the reason why the Nobel took it is that some of the work I did on famines, for example, connecting information about prices and wage data in the neighboring farms, whenever there was any account. Happened on the bike? Yes, I went on the bike. And similarly, when I was doing my work on, on gender inequality, weighing boys and girls, uh, like in the villages of Kuchli and Shahadapur, I weighed every child in those villages to compare the boys and girls and different ages to see how girls and boys are born much the same kind of uh, nutritional state and, and in weight, and as over time, even within five years, girls fall behind compared with boys in a way that indicates 
you know, not so much differential feeding, but more differential medical access. The, the boy is taken to a, to a, to a, to a hospital or, or, you know, or to a doctor, not hospital, doctor uh, much more easily than a girl. And so I was doing all that. I mean, I couldn't have done, couldn't have been mobile. Without the bike. In that territory, because, you know, you can't, I mean, you need, a, no car will go anyway. During and those bike years, there were two cataclysmic events that you witnessed at first hand. The first was the Bengal famine of 43. You were barely nine or ten. What exactly did you see and what sort of impact did it have on you? Well, it had a, as you might expect, it had a kind of um, um, devastating impact because I didn't know what was going on. I mean, there were peculiar features about it. The suddenness, suddenly, the one deranged man came in and we didn't know what was happening. I knew later that that's the characteristic of being starving for a long time. Then five, ten, a hundred, then a thousand, they were all over walking. We were on the way from some of the famine districts to um, to Calcutta. So people were marching to Calcutta on the ground that there would be more relief there. It must so have left a terrible impact on that the it did. Man. But you see, the other thing was that the, the puzzling thing was that I knew absolutely nobody who had the slightest difficulty acquiring food. So the reality of, of class suddenly made a kind of big appearance in me. And at 9 and 10 you sense that? Yes, because it's, uh, I, you know, I remember asking my, my uh, grandfather, who was a Sanskritist, and, you know, but very keen on chatting on these things. So I said, you know, how come I don't know anyone? Who are, where are these coming from? So, and, uh, and, and, you know, he was quite aware of um, my interest by then in this class issue. And then, of course, when I studied famine later on, it would become quite clear that that's a characteristic of virtually all famines. There are very few famines which affect more than 5% of the population, Not almost never more than 10. And they all come from one occupation group or another which happened to be hit. In the case of Bengal famine, it was the rural laborers, primarily agricultural laborers, rural transport workers, rural skilled suppliers, and fishermen. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's that kind of category of people who get completely blighted. So that was the other thing, and in some ways, I, was, I mean, I, I hadn't analyzed it, I wasn't capable of that, but I knew the questions I wanted to ask even then. I did think, I have to say, that even though at that time I wanted to be either a Sanskritist or a physicist, not an economist, I did think that at some stage, if I had some little leisure I'd like to work on that, then I did become an economist. But I didn't get on to it much later, until the 70s. In fact, just a few years after the famine, when you were still very much in your teens, there was another dreadful event that you had to witness which brought home to you the horrors of communalism. You were in Dhaka when you actually saw a man called Kader Mia being stabbed in front of you. That's right, yes. That was a, also a devastating experience. This is the, um, the first murdered person, of, you know, person dying of murder that I ever seen. Actually, I haven't seen that many even afterwards. But, well, I saw some during the riots, of course. But this was the beginning of this was the beginning of the riots, and it's sort of coming into the uh, the Dhaka city. Um, the city was quite divided at that time. Wari was a primarily Hindu region, and this was a landless laborer who was coming into this Wari area, Muslim laborer, for a little work, and he got stabbed by some Hindu thug just outside the. Uh, our house, and he came into my uh, house. I was playing in the garden, and I, I had to hold him. Uh, he was wanting water. I had to get some water. I shouted until my father arrived, who took him to the hospital, and, and he died there. But when we were chatting, he was uh, he chatted with me before he died, and he, was, uh, in fact, almost seemed a seemed. Uh, I mean, given the fact that I was only ten or eleven, it was amazing how keen he was in speaking, and he was mainly saying that his wife had told him not to go, because it's a dangerous thing, but there was nothing at home to eat. And the other thing suddenly became clear to me in that context uh, is, that, um, is that how economic unfreedom generates unfreedom of other kind, because Kadermia did not have a choice, really, because in order to feed the family and so on, he felt he had to go and take this risk, and then he... He, he died. And clearly, clearly, today in retrospect, both these look like seminal events in your life. But at the time, when you were 9, 10, 11, were you aware that these were going to be important landmarks and would feature prominently in your career thereafter? 
Well, I don't know about carrier, because I didn't think of that, but they featured prominently in my mind all the time. Yes, the Kademir was a big... Uh, it troubled you? Troubled me. The class question I mentioned came in here, too, because it was quite clear, since I also knew some others who had been stabbed, Hindus and Muslims, that while their identity, religious identity, were different, their class identity were almost exactly the same. Because once a riot happens, uh, each community's thugs are trying to kill the maximum number on the other side. And the easiest people to kill are the poor. The, the, the guys who are in the slum, the guys who have to, have to go out to work, They're rather than middle class people who, who, if necessary, will, will enter, you know, stay in the shell. So it's the exposed people. And so, in fact, the victims, their class identity are almost identical even though their communal identity are totally opposite, namely Hindu and Muslim. Now that actually is a thought which again, in a sense, added to the class issue that had come up in the famine context. It's not that I was thinking profoundly about that, but... But the beginnings agitating. were starting. Well, it was agitating me. It was really more a sense of disquiet rather than a, a sense of understanding. Professor Zen, let's take a break. I want to come back in part two and talk about the career that was about to unfold and a little bit more about you and the personal tribulations you've had to face up to as well. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stay with us. Welcome back. My guest is Amartya Sen. Over the last four decades, you've held professorships in Harvard, London School of Economics, Oxford, not to mention Delhi University and Jadavpur University. Academically, do you belong anywhere? Oh, I think we belong everywhere, actually. Ac ac the academic question is easy because, you know, in a sense, um, the academic life extends everywhere. And, um, you know, there isn't a, I mean, the academic community is, um, is, is marvelously open in that sense. I think there's a question about where geographically, home, you know, what's the... What do you consider home? I consider all these home, and I think the question is wrong, which is often asked. You didn't ask it, but I'm often asked that. Namely, what is your real home? Because it's not, I mean, I have a home, and I live in Trinity now, a uh, lovely 16th century. But you know uh, the place. corollary but to being at home all over the world? Yes. It's that you're rootless in no part of it. Uh, that is the mistake, which I'm, uh, now that you have fallen into it, so <laughs> let me pursue that. Um, I don't believe that. I think it comes from that kind of prejudice. It's, it's like saying, uh, you know, um, what do you like, lunch or dinner? Uh, I mean, it seems to me that it's possible for you to like both. And I think it's perfectly possible. I feel very much at home in Trinity. I feel very at home in the ha home that I own in Boston. I feel very at home in Santa Niketan, uh, where I still have a home. The same uh, eclecticism also then in a sense applies to the many disciplines that you've adopted as your own. It's not just economics, but philosophy, mathematics, ethics, not to mention abiding interest in Sanskrit and poetry. That, well, it's very kind of you to mention it. You know, when we were talking about this Nobel, um, things like the bike going there, the other two objects that took were these two books, Sanskrit books on mathematics, namely Aryabhat's Aryabhat, Aryabhatiya, fifth century book about, um, you know, Aryabhat's uh, uh, astronomy and mathematics, and Bhaskar, 12th century. And I, I remember sort of reading them thrilling, uh, you know, in a thrilled way, because it, sa it satisfied both my interest in maths and uh, axiomatic reasoning, which is actually quite a big bit in Bhaskar. But, but given this mm -hmm. range of interest mm -hmm. that you've always had, how would you then describe yourself? Economist seems to be too small and slight. Well, I don't think it is slight. I, I, I think a proper economist might even wonder whether I am one in the sense that I don't devote enough time, perhaps exclusive time, to economics, which I don't, because I'm interested in philosophy and sociology, cultural studies, and even now in decision theory, uh, mathematical logic, and so on. But I don't, again, like having different, I mean, you, you put it in that context, of course, that it's not like having a home, uh, one home, many homes, I would say many disciplines. Again, I don't see any great conflict in that. You know, when one, I mean, I'm a skeptical man. I believe we, we lead a one life. Uh, it would have been wonderful to have the reincarnation, but I don't think we have that. So given the fact that you have one life, 
and you have a lot of interest, uh, beginning from maths and Sanskrit, which were my earliest interests. You're determined to make the most of it. Yes, and, uh, and why not? I mean, it seems to me, and uh, if, if it ended up that one of them distracts me from doing something on the other, it's not the case. It's, uh, for example, in philosophy, my interest in philosophy is not about philosophy of economics. People often ask me that question. I've been primarily concerned originally in logic, then in ethics, and then epistemology, but not so much in particularly economics. But on the other hand, the philosophy doesn't get into my way while I'm doing an economic problem. There's something you've begun doing recently a lot of, and that is you've articulated a very strong conviction-based vision of what you think India should be. You see it increasingly, I get the feeling, as an accommodating, liberal, pluralist country. Do you feel as a Nobel laureate that you have almost a duty to propagate this vision? I don't think as a Nobel laureate I do, but as an Indian citizen I think I do. Because I think there's a big tradition of India, which I don't think we adequately um, uh, recognize how big a tradition it is. When you say we, do you mean we Indians? We Indians, yes. I mean, uh, the, I mean Ashoka, when he was talking about tolerance, I mean, the, that was one of the earliest statements. I know of nothing in, 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 in Greek or Latin uh, at, that, uh, at that time or, or even for a while afterwards, which so clearly articulated the, the fact that you could disagree and still respect each other and have a right to speak, and the state has a duty to protect that. Do you think that the state today and the society you see in India is moving away from that Ashokan well, idea? Well, I think so. I think, uh, I mean, of course, the proximate uh, state, uh, statement of that comes from Akbar. And in fact, there is more of a connection, legal connection, with, with the world of Akbar, you know, 400 years ago and the world today. I think we, we have tended to move away. When Akbar, in the 1590s, were making a statement about religious tolerance and the need for it, this is the time when the Inquisitions were going on in Europe. Giardino Bruno was burnt at the stake for heresy in Campo di Fiori in 1600. I think we have an exceptionally great tradition, and when people say democracy came from the West, well, democracy had many parts, which had majority vote, but also um, open public discussion, tolerance. I think we have as long a tradition on open public discussion and tolerance but as is, anywhere. Is there a sense in which today you're pushing India in a particular direction, perhaps subtly, but by reminding India of its past, which it may have forgotten. Uh, to some extent. I think that is a tradition of which we have every reason to be proud. And it does seem to me that when many um, of the political activists express great pride on Indian history, it, it doesn't seem to me to know exactly what is it that they have a good reason to be proud of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Professor Sen, I hope there are many who listen to you and take heed of those words. Thank you very much for coming Thank you. on this program. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed.